So there is so many people in this room. <laughs> it's a bit intimidating. Um, I'm Julien Bernier. I will speak about Cyber Resilience Act and the impact on Yocto-based products. So full disclosure, I'm not a developer. I'm the security guy. I'm the guy who asks all the stupid questions and come with uh, all the impossible requirements. Uh, so it, we will be more on the methodological side than on the technical side. Uh, nevertheless, we've been preparing this talk with people from WeTQ. So that's my company. We're a software company. We are developing basically IoT products uh, for uh, yeah, people who want to sell IoT products. Uh, initially, uh, we were more on the embedded side and uh, we grew a bit. Uh, now we're developing uh, low level, high level. We also uh, can uh, do work on the, on the cloud side as well. And uh, I encourage you to, to go and check the, the company's website if you want to have more information. So this talk is about the Cyber Resilience Act, basically, and what does it mean precisely for us as developers and for the manufacturers. In the end, they will be the one responsible for, uh, for any requirement in the Cyber Resilience Act. Um, full disclosure again, everything I will tell today may be subject to change in the next three years because uh, the Cyber Resilience Act has been voted in some final form, but then we are waiting for precisions. So right now, it's a 300 something pages long low that has, well, that is kind of high level. And we need some precisions and they will come, I hope, later. So uh, we will do what we can with, with what we know right now, okay? So where does it come from? Um, you all know this, um, the security landscape is uh, more and more uh, threatening, so to say. Um, the cost of cybercrime uh, is huge and is becoming huger, don't even know if it's a word, <laughs> more and more huge. Um, okay, we know about the ransomware threat, we know about uh, operational technology, actually that, that's the big one because uh, we didn't have that much attacks on operational technology uh, out in the wild up to now, but cybersecurity experts think that it will be the next problem. Somewhere in the next two years, we may see the first actual attack that will directly make people die, which has not been the case up to now. We can argue about the directly or indirectly. Uh, and this is basically because we've got lots and lots of connected devices in the operational environment that may impact critical connected devices. And this is basically what the Cyber Resilience Act is about, and I will come to this. So you've got the references for anything I say. I said in this slide down there, so you don't have to, to take my word for, for granted. Uh, to answer to this, what is the posture of the, the global ecosystem? So we've got governing bodies, nations, uh, groupments of nations like Europe, and we've got the private sector. So basically the governing bodies are issuing laws. In Europe, we've got regulations and we've got directives. These laws are binding. Uh, compliance to these uh, regulations and directives is mandatory, depending on whether we are speaking about a regulation or a, a, a directive. It will need to be incorporated into the national bodies laws. Uh, for regulation, the regulation is valid for all of Europe. Uh, and by definition, since they are so binding, they are kind of high level. And then we've got the private sector. The private sector is trying to anticipate the regulations somehow by structuring each market, by providing standards. And these standards should be finer, should be more concrete, should be usable as guides for the industry to, um, to go in the right direction what is expected are actual requirements that can be applied in a product development life cycle. Since the private sector 
is no government. Compliance to uh, standard is usually voluntary, with some exceptions for some specific markets, when there is a compliance that will hint at some standard uh, as a mandatory one. Okay? So actually, we don't like cybersecurity regulations in Europe. Actually, we've got a whole lot bunch of them, and for a long time. So maybe the, the, the most well-known is the GDPR. GDPR is not a cybersecurity regulation per se, but it has uh, cybersecurity elements. You are any product manufacturer, any software manufacturer, any user of the software is supposed to protect its uh, personal data, the personal data of its customers and, and etc. Um, really, the, 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 the central one is the Cyber Security Act. You don't want to make the confusion between the Cyber Security Act and the Cyber Resilience Act, which are two different beasts. So the Cyber Security Act is there since 2019, and it's basically a law that states that the ENISA, the European Agency for Cyber Security, is, uh, well, is the European Agency for Cyber Security, and it tasked the ENISA to come up with Cyber, cyber Security Certification Scheme. So we've got one example of this, which is kind of ready, which is the EUCC for uh, European Common Criteria. Uh, and some of them that are in the works. We've got one certification scheme for the 5G. It's the EU 5G. There are works around uh, some um, cybersecurity certification scheme for AI uh, elements, but this one is upcoming. Uh, the problem with the Cyber Security Act is that it's not binding. Again, it's a regulation, but basically it states that we will have cybersecurity certification scheme in Europe. It's the ENISA's work to, to, to build these certification schemes, but um, nothing is mandatory. So with respect to the, what I provided the, the, my previous slide, we needed something more binding, and that's the aim of the Cyber Science Act, mandatory for all manufacturers. So the motivations, we already saw them. One of the key points is point two here. Basically, up to now, critical devices, critical products, sensitive products, products used in critical environments were already subject to some form of cybersecurity uh, certification. But now, what the CRA acknowledges is the fact that a non-sensitive device can affect, can be an attack vector for another more critical device. So really, the aim is to say we need a regulation that covers all devices whatsoever, assuming they have some form of connection with other devices. Okay? So that they cannot be attack vectors, so that they have to stick to a baseline of cybersecurity, not be... Uh, secure product completely, not, 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 not be considered as critical products, but that good practices, good cybersecurity practices are enforced on these products. So that's really the, the global aim of the CA, CRA. Uh, I already talked about the CAC in the EUCC. There is something also that is important in the CRA, is the obligation of transparency. The idea behind the CRA is that the customers can make the choice to buy a product based on cybersecurity considerations. So that they, it's, it's important for the Europe that the customer is able to compare two products with respect to how secure they are. Okay? So in a nutshell, and that comes from the Europe website, this is the, the aim of the CRA. Let's take a nice Swiss cheese with many holes, and let's try to have a bit less holes. Okay? So, we've got the CRA. It's been drafted in 2022. It's been voted uh, last uh, March, I think, and it should be inscribed as a law in the European Corpus of Law in the following weeks, I guess. That's the, that was the plan, actually. Um, we have requirements regarding cybersecurity management, and that's this, this one is new with, compared with the other uh, regulations for the whole life cycle of the product. It means that we will deal with 
product development, but we will also deal with product maintenance. And this is a, a big one. Uh, thus, we've got emphasis in vulnerability management. And we've got fines. This one is really binding and mandatory, and the fines are huge. The fines are on the same level as the one for the, the GDPR. So you can guess that uh, manufacturers, I mean, at least all of our customers in WTQ, are kind of a bit concerned about what is coming. And we don't have all, all the answers. That's, that's the, the nice point. So what's in there? Basically, it's my view. We've got five blocks of requirement. OK, the usual one is security by design, whatever that means. Uh, it means that your product needs to be secure somehow, and it needs to be secure from day one. Uh, we, you need to have developed, deployed, tested, and, uh, and you need to maintain your product in a secure way. We'll come this, to this later, because that's really, in my opinion, linked to the second point, which is the security risk assessment. Usually, when we speak about security risk assessment, when if, you, if you Google it, you will fall on many, many pages with many methods with various names. Um, and uh, it's not clear what would be the good qualities of a proper security risk assessment. And, well, how useful would it be when you are a product developer? How do you use or do you do a security risk assessment? Or, do, or do, how do you use it? So bad luck, now it's mandatory. This document has to be provided by the product manufacturer as part of the compliance documentation. It's mandatory to use it. That's the first block. And uh, the third bad point is that they do not say how to do a security risk assessment, obviously, in the regulation. So the manufacturers have to figure out for themselves how to do this. OK? Uh, then we've got vulnerabilities management. You need to deliver a software which is free from exploitable vulnerability, and you need to keep it this way during its whole lifetime. That's a bit more. It's during its, its whole lifetime with five years as a minimum. You need to do vulnerability management, and you need, that's the first block, to provide security patches. Automatic if possible. The last one, is that you are all the product manufacturers are now compelled, will be compelled, and I will go back to the timeline uh, at the end of this presentation, to report any security incident. So it, it includes security incidents, attacks, actual attacks, but it also includes any new vulnerability on the product. So they will need to report to the authorities. They will need to come up with a plan to fix the vulnerability or at least an assessment stating that the vulnerability is not relevant uh, with a fixed amount, within a fixed amount of time. That's 72 hours, I guess. Uh, and I don't know for you, but for 90% of our customers, this is completely new. Most of them don't even know what they have as software. Yeah? I think you also have to be for free. Yes. And this, will, this won't be possible anymore. <laughs> Not only can, must it be for free, but if you as a software manufacturer, as a product manufacturer, get fix some vulnerability on some open source component, then you are compelled to uh, push this fix to the original developer. And that's a big one as well. It's not in the standard practices, even for large companies. So this could be a game changer. So, I will focus on two points because, okay, we don't have all day. Um, I will make a proposition for security risk assessment, or at least I will hint at what we are doing at, in WeTechU to do uh, what is our method to do the risk assessment. Since no one is, no method is mandated, we came up with our own, uh, and we didn't invent it because it's and security risk assessment has been there for a long time, so we tried to use uh, some practices. I'll just give you a quick sneak peek about how we are doing this. Uh, and vulnerability management will be a, a huge focus, of, obviously. So, risk assessment. Up there, on the white box, you've got the actual text in the CRA. 
So you need to do a security risk assessment and you need to take the outcome to basically drive your development, production, delivery and maintenance process. Okay, how do we do this? Actually, we are more, I mean, what is a security risk assessment? Risk assessment does not provide answers. It describes a problem. Now we are product developers, we need answers. We need to describe the problem, that's the security problem, and we need to come up with a security solution because we cannot just say there is a problem, and we need to mitigate things, okay? So, all of this is standard practice. I will just uh, sum it up. First, you need an attack surface. So this one is pretty obvious. When you are describing the attack surface, you make no assumption whatsoever about whether it's easy or not to use an interface. That's a common pitfall we have with our customers is, um, no, but um, I don't know. Let's not consider JTAG, for instance. Yes, I have a JTAG, it's in my product, but uh, no one will ever open my product. Okay, this is not what you are doing. At some point you will have to bring in some assumptions because you cannot protect against anything. When, you, when describing your attack surface in the first place, you need to be exhaustive. So you need hardware and, and software interfaces. It's good practice to sort them according, categorize them according to how easy it is to gain access to these uh, interfaces. And later on also with what impact can be expected by someone misusing these interfaces. Then you need to check the attack model. You will never be able to protect against any attacker with an arbitrary uh, uh, amount of time, of expertise, of money, of uh, whatever is needed to mount, the, to mount an attack. I mean, you can take any product, secure product, if you give it to a skilled penetration test lab, and you give them, you tell them, you've got all the time you want, just tell me when you succeeded in doing a, an actual attack, they will succeed. Maybe after 10 years, but they will succeed. Okay, so we need to fix a little bit. Depending on the product and for regarding the CRA, it's kind of hinted into the classification they are make, making between important critical and non-important products. You need to have a clear description of what are the kind of attackers you will deal with, okay? And why is that? Well, it's because if you think about it, attacks really are uh, someone abusing something that you did not expect, something that as a developer you did not plan for. So that's really always an unexpected behavior. It can be due to design errors, you just forgot some authentication, for instance, or some test mode or diagnostic mode can, could be abused and is still in the product. It can be because you've got a perfect design, but your imp implementation is faulty somehow. There is some bug with, which gives rise to a runtime error that could be exploited by an attacker. Um, okay, let's assume you've got a perfect design and also your program is completely bug free. I don't know if this exists, but let's assume this. Um, then the attackers come into, uh, into the picture. You've got to consider robustness considerations. Maybe your product is perfectly v robust, secure from a functional point of view, but now did you think about brute force attacks on your keys or on your passwords? Okay, this is not a functional requirement. Maybe you forgot about it and that's normal. But now if you give me the possibility to run 10 thousands of user authentication without any delay or limit or whatsoever, then I will do it as an attacker. So you need to consider also all possible ways of compromising a product that is not robust enough. Side channel is a big one. And there is a debate. Do we need to, as, as, uh, do I need as a product developer, as a product manufacturer to uh, deal with side channel attacks for my product that is not a critical one? It's, it's not clear and it needs to be decided on a product by product basis, that's part of the risk assessment. Also, you've got external modification, usually these ones are kind of overkill. These are the ones we are considering, for instance, for smart cards or, or TPMs, but, um, but usually they are out of the scope. Maybe not, I mean, a glitch, fault injection, could be 
sort of easy to set up and could uh, break a security mechanism. So maybe this is part of your uh, attack model. What I want to say is that there are too many ways for an attacker to attack a product. You cannot think about everything. I cannot think about everything. We do not want to aim for exhaustive coverage for a completely secure product. I don't think this exists. So what we should do is focus on the actual threats on, uh, that are on the product, and then, well, try to figure out how this threat could be exploited. So that's the whole point of doing uh, a risk analysis. So what we do is usually so that we build an attack tree. So it's, it's a pretty simple uh, formalism to use for uh, risk analysis. It's been introduced by uh, Bruce Schneier in the 80s. And that's basically inspired by um, fault trees. Uh, what you do is that you've got your threats. So you need to come up with the threats as the, as, at, the, at the root of as the first level of your tree. You've got many ways of doing this. You can just think about it, try to be uh, exhaustive. You can use also uh, systematic methods such as Stride that will come up with a list of threats for you by crisscrossing any assets, any possibility of spoofing, tampering, etc. with them. And then for each threat, you will try to figure out, well, you will try to, to, to be in the mind of an attacker and realize how would I implement this threat, okay? And these are the attack paths. I will provide an example because like this, it's not completely uh, obvious. The important thing is that whenever I have a complete attack path, whenever I unfolded my tree uh, completely, then the leaves of my tree are possible potential attack scenarios I need to deal with or I need to figure out why I don't have to deal with. Maybe some of them are unfeasible. Maybe one of these attack paths, I just stopped at some point because we just exceeded what was expected from a, a standard attacker for this kind of product, and I can flag it as unrealistic. But most of them, I will have to do something. Okay, let's take a very simple example of an attack tree. We'll start with a, okay, it's an imaginary product. A generic threat would be modify sensitive data because this data is sensitive for some reason or some other. So as an attacker, I can try to modify it on the device. Let's assume it's a device that communicates with some cloud backend or whatever. Uh, or I can try to modify it on the communication channel. Let's grab the second one. For instance, I can try a man-in-the-middle attack. Set up a man-in-the-middle attack, and you'll have to forgive me, it's really, uh, really an example. Uh, I will... Uh, have four steps to do. I must impersonate the device to the cloud endpoint. The other way around, if I want to be able to uh, relay messages and, and still be transparent, uh, that's the, my first point. And I need to have the ability to tamper with the data. Uh, and this one should be uh, easy if I have the three of us. And as a security expert now, I've got this. And I, I will try to figure out how do you, we protect against this. First, do I need to protect against this? Let's assume uh, I realized that impersonating the device to the cloud endpoint is perfectly doable for some reason uh, because I can intercept the communication at some point. I've got a nice and easy point, etc., etc. Then I will come up with a solution, and my solution is twofold. First, I need device authentication, so I need my device to have its own uh, uh, asymmetric key pair, its certificate, and used, for instance, uh, uh, TLS client authentication to 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 prove that it's the right device, okay? And then also, I would need another thing. I would need that the cloud endpoint to check this device authentication, otherwise it's useless, okay? But maybe it's not in my, pay, my scope as a device maker. Nevertheless, and during the security risk assessment, makes it possible to list everything that is assumed so that the security solution works. And that's basically what we expect from a, risk a security risk assessment. It's not only describing the problem, but describing the solution. We need a complete list of security objectives for the product that are technical objectives, security mechanism that will need to be implemented in the product. And we need also to have a list of assumptions that were made about the operational env environment, so the, the, where the product will live, and uh, some form of uh, evidence that these assumptions are true. There is some policy that makes, there is some uh, uh, commitment from the developer of these other components that it will check the device authentication, for instance, these kind of things. 
And then this risk assessment, okay, it's a mandatory document for the CRA, but it must be used. Sorry. So we need to use the security objective for the product to drive the development validation. And we need to use the, the security objective for the environment to make a proper security documentation that will make it clear against what we are protecting and in which conditions. Now, let's switch to vulnerability management. That's another one which is not typical for most of our customers. You need to be aware of your vulnerabilities and you need to be aware of your vulnerabilities across time. So first step, you need to know what's in your product. So you need a robust, automatic, if possible, process to produce your software bill of material. And uh, you need it to be precise enough so that you can get the vulnerabilities. It's not always easy, depending on the cases. Um, chances are that if you are using Yocto, for instance, then you already have some tools to produce the software bill of material. Uh, but the software bill of material should be on the complete product. If anything is not defined in your Yocto build, first it's bad, and then, uh, well, you have to, to deal with this, you have to, to, to know what's in your product, and then you need, well, to be able to grab the vulnerabilities for this. Fortunately, you've got the NVD for this, you've got several initiatives like DOSV, etc., that will allow you to grab these vulnerabilities. Probably you would need some tooling to do this because you don't want to check all the vulnerabilities by hand. And you need assess expert time to assess the vulnerabilities because not all vulnerabilities are relevant for your product. Maybe some of them are not exploitable. Maybe some of them are, uh, uh, do not have any exploit at some point, so you need to monitor them carefully, but, um, but uh, there is no guarantee that someone is able to exploit it and there is maybe no patch for this vulnerability for some reason. So you need some expert time. And obviously you need a secure update mechanism to be able to push the patches to your, um, to your uh, devices. Sorry. So, uh, so ideally it would be automatic that's the terms of the CRA. If not possible, there should be some notification so that it, it's extremely clear and very timely that a new update, secure update, is, is ready for, the, for your product and that you need to install it and how to install it. If you're using Yocto, you can use CVCheck, for instance. Uh, it comes with Yocto. You can just uh, uh, enable in a red CV check. Uh, then you can also modify re your recipes to, um, well, fix possibly. So usually the recipes uh, come with proper CV product and version uh, labeling. If it's not the case, you can do this yourself. Although uh, I would not, uh, I would not um, advise you to do this too much. You can label, uh, provide different status for the vulnerabilities and you can annotate this. So you can also um, flag some CVs uh, to be uh, not applicable, for instance, so that they are ignored. So you can do your CV assessment during using CV check, for instance. Also, what you can do with Yocto is that, that you can um, export your uh, software bill of material in SPDX format, and then use external tooling to request the, the CVs, that's the, the vulnerabilities, so it's also working. And then this is the kind of output you would get. Maybe then you can use it in an automatic tool, you can provide a, a, a CV report that you can provide, supply to the authorities whenever they, they want to check. There is no exploitable vulnerability, and you can say what you did to fix the vulnerabilities in there. Okay. Uh, now, there may be some problems with, uh, with uh, CV check right now. The first thing is that uh, for a typical Yocto system, we've got a huge number of CVs. So the first naive and like, kind of dumb approach is to take all the vulnerabilities possible regardless of the version number of the package. On a typical, I think these, these figures are from, from a, from a Coxton build roughly, so hence the tilde symbols here. On a typical system, you would get 5,000 dish vulnerabilities for, um, for the, pro the sample we are using, uh, but without looking at the version number, so it's 
really CV check will give you more like 1,000 vulnerabilities for a complete system, which is still large. Uh, many of them will come from the Cardell, to be honest. So what we can do also, that what we do in WTQ is that we are doing some automatic filtering based on the kernel configurations because uh, really the kernel is only one component with respect to the NVD. So we can, if we grab more information about how it was compiled, then we can get rid of many false positives. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that we can automatically check for patches in, in, uh, in how the kernel was built which allows us to automatically boil down this number to 200 vulnerabilities, CVs, which is more manageable. I can do 200. I cannot do 5,000. Um, more than I would take a lot of time. Yes? Yes. So you would have to rerun. So that this CV process needs to be automatic. It needs to be in your pipeline and you need so at some point, you will need some expert time. So you, you will need a human that does not live in a pipeline, obviously. Uh, but you can notify this human that there has been a new build, there has been a change in configuration, and uh, you can have a tooling that will outline what is the delta so that you don't have to run through all the, the work that has already been done. Yes? Globally? They also yes. 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 So we did not use CV check. So um, I, I won't spend a lot of this on this, but to do this, we actually modified. Uh, we, we started from CV check and we added some information in it because we wanted to grab all the kernel configuration options and, and additional information to do the filtering here. So we have our own CV check, and so we are able to see what happens if you don't look at the version number, which is not really useful, to be honest. The CV check is run against the kernel Sorry? They also run the CV check against the kernel nodules. Yes. Yes, indeed. But we, d we are not using CV check. I, I can show you if you want uh, anyway, after the talk. So, uh, what you're saying, what the does is crap. No. Ah. No, no. <laughs> I'm not saying this. I I'm saying that with the Yocto project, with a typical product, I would have this kind of figure. And that's too large. And when, when we do this, we are doing iteratively a lot of work and when we do this on several projects, we need to capitalize somehow. So we just came up with, so we've got this filtering, we've got internal annotations for the CVs that always pop up and we know that they shouldn't in some or some specific uh, uh, configuration. I'm not saying CV check is crap, that's the reason why I, I showed it. And, and the, 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 the nice thing is that, that it's open source and it's in Yocto. Yes, yes, no problem. We can check. Uh, it, this would take some time, but I'm really happy to to grab contact and, and work on this uh, with you. So y what you're saying is that this number is too huge for a typical Yocto, embedded Yocto project. But actually, this, it can happen in this way. And, you know, that's always the history that if you press the number, the knob, they tell you everything. Mm -hmm. We 
you're looking there at the point, and there's, of course, we are using the company doctor there, and there's a lot of things that need to be done inside the, to extract properly there to get the information about the characteristics of the doctor. So, what the doctor produced today, it's false positives most of the time, because it cannot, cannot tell the entire history. So, they made it right, but the results are not expected. So, that's exactly like this. But the numbers can get exactly like this. It's not. But uh, I can, I mean, uh, these this, uh, numbers come from a Yocto build that we own, so there is absolutely no problem to check the list and see if there is something wrong in what you will no, use with it. Yes, so we need to check this first. <laughs> Okay, so let, let, let's check this. If you have f a few minutes after the talk, let's, let's get, get our contacts and work on this. So, okay, I've got four minutes. This one will be uh, quick, very quick. Um, platforming approach is a good thing because, um, I mean, I've just came out from the talk from Sigma Star. There is a lot of things in Linux that you can use for security, but what can we use uh, in order to protect uh, the product? And this is basically where you want to drive your, um, your uh, development using your security risk assessment. And you want a platforming approach because you want to organize your security watch on your product and you do not want to do this once for each and every product. So this is where Yocto shines. Um, now, what we could do is try to have the same distribution for several products so that we can do the CV assessment for all the components of this distribution in the right way so that we can also uh, have the right security uh, mechanisms in, in the platform, the right software bricks in order to, to do the, the stuff and that we have kind of a very good security documentation for this platform that would be uh, guidelines of how to use the platform in order to build a final product in a, in a, in a, that, that would be secure. Why is this? So that's basically what I want to do with these two slides. Let's try to have as much common component as possible, a single distribution that would be the one that you maintain from a from a, on which you maintain your vulnerabilities for several sets of hardware and uh, applicative layers that you will put, that will run on this. The, the issue is that you, so okay, the schema is not completely right, but the issue is that you cannot do the risk assessment, I mean, you can do the risk assessment at the Yocto level. I can do risk analysis of Yocto. Uh, the threats would be generic on any, uh, on Yocto, sorry, on Linux. So the threats will be generic with respect to a Linux platform. But what the CRA expects you to have is a security assessment for the final product with many things that would be considered non-reachable by an attacker because if you do things right, then your applicative is the only uh, attack surface you will have, you will get rid of superfluous software, you will get rid of interfaces that have nothing to do with, the, with your product. So you should do the risk, you must do the risk assessment on the final product. It means that we need to have uh, some level of, some form of composition that, that could be done on a, on, a, on a secure platform. It means that at some point when I will have my Example, attack tree. At some point, I will have device authentication. Now that's a secure mechanism that maybe is part of my software platform because I have embedded the, the right software component to manage a certificate, a signing, doing a TLS client authentication. But now, still, an attacker may try to compromise this device authentication by compromising it at the platform level. So now I've got another attack tree. I can compose with my first one, where I will end up with security objectives for the secure platform. So uh, again, it's a bit naive, but use some form of hardware protection in order to store your key and do the, sig the signature, for instance. And then we'll branch to another attack tree, 
which would be the one provided by the hardware manufacturer. Because it comes, I don't know, there is some embedded secure element, maybe it, I can use uh, uh, transition based TE to, to handle my keys and do the signing. Maybe there is an external TPM, depending on the cases. But nevertheless, there is a security problem here, and there is a security solution that can be accept, uh, expected from the hardware manufacturer. This way, I don't have to do the whole work for all of my product. I can leverage risk assessment that is sound at the platform level and that is maintained across time and that will help me do the, the maintenance. And I can handle the vulnerabilities on the long run on this, um, cap well, factorize my, my efforts, so, so as to say. And the key here is a good security documentation because this security documentation would, for the platform, would provide a template security risk assessment for the final product, <laughs> how to compose the, the security objectives with the underlying risk assessment, and also the down to half guidelines about what to do and what not to do on this secure platform in order not to break the security mechanisms that are in place, how to use them properly, and what is expected from me as an application developer in order to close my platform and to, to have something that is robust. And that would be also expected by the CRA as part of the security documentation. I'm sorry, I think I, we run out of time, so I will just quick run the um, last slides. To conclude, here are the, the highlights from the CRA. So, I will just let, you, let them here. It's uh, with the references to the actual text of the CRA. If you want to check them yourselves, you can check, sorry, I didn't have time for the QR code, but you can check this link. That's the actual final text for the Cyberresilience Act. And the interesting stuff starts on page 297. <laughs> I can tell you, I read the other ones. Uh, I will conclude on this. This is the timeline already. Uh, so we are waiting for the CRA to be officially inscribed in the official journal of Europe. Then we will have 24 months before the obligation to report new vulnerabilities and incidents is a thing for all products. And then 12 months more, so it makes 36 months before the CRA is completely into force, is, is completely mandatory. What also, so this is the really interesting point, we don't have harmonized standard. Although it's 300 and something pages, I told you it's really high level. The Europe should ask for harmonized standard that will tell the product manufacturer, developers and everyone what to do precisely. But up to now, we have nothing. So if you want my bet on this, I think we will have harmonized standard something like two weeks before the end of 2027. And they will be huge. If, if we, I mean, they just did it for the radio equipment directive, there were something like, I don't know, maybe 10 lines in the radio equipment directive in terms of cybersecurity requirements. And it's, I think, 400 pages of harmonized standards that has been published uh, two weeks ago. So, um, so I'm waiting for this. And this concludes my talk. I don't know if we have, still have a bit of time for the questions. Um, well, as far as I understand, uh, at least in the Octo project, we look for the uh, CV stuff from an American database. I mean, as the European Union, do we really want to do that? And uh, is there a European database somewhere? Because the Americans might pay that or not. They have issues with it. I think there is a real problem with the NVD. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm, I'm not the only one, but nevertheless, the NVD is the result of a, a, a large and international effort. I mean, the NVD is just collecting CVs from the CV numbering authorities. 
uh, there are many civil numbering authorities. The fact that it's a federal agency that is putting the last stamp and providing uh, the scoring and CPs is problematic and it's been have, acknowledged by the NVD as well. They didn't have funding for some months or yes. so, so they are... Yeah, that's, that's, uh, the whole entire supply chain community are looking there. So in, the, in the open chain project we started to discuss it. Using package URL as a standard definition for the future, they have it, we use it inside the DEX format for the security. Hmm. So we are not, not only relying anymore on our CVEs or specific numbers, but we have specific IDs that can be multiple IDs for the same security. So it's not anymore related only for the, the American institute. Yes, and to be honest, I think that there was a reaction from the NIST at some point that would advocate for a larger international effort, uh, non-governmental. You have a question? Thank you. Uh, let's say that we are building five highly special products per year. Are we mandatory to follow these rules as well? Do, can, can you say the big, I didn't understand the beginning of the question, sorry. Uh, let's say that we are producing five highly special devices per year and we are selling them to customers publicly. Uh, are we do we need to follow these, all these rules as well? They connected? Uh, let's say yes. Directly or indirectly? Yes, let's yes. say yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. As far as I understand, yes. So now, uh, you honestly, uh, I'm not a European a representative of the European Union, far from it. So I'm pretty sure, I mean, right now we've got uh, high level kind of theoretical legislation. It will stay legislation, but there will be many, uh, I, f I expect that there are many uh, uh, refinements, many specific cases that will happen and that will be uh, uh, ingested somehow. But right now I cannot tell. Yes? <coughs> So you, you will need so you will need to uh, provide everything for any CE certification. So that's one thing. Then um, even so, n most products are labeled by C, but it's not the case for all of them. Uh, in any case, uh, for most products, it will be self-assessment because there is n there are simply not enough security evaluation facilities in Europe to evaluate all products. So it will mainly be self-assessment, except for important product class two and critical products. But um, it means that in case of a problem, if you cannot, in the blink of the eye, supply your uh, security risk assessment, SBOM, and, and, and CV, uh, CV report, then it will be a problem. If there is an incident where you are part of, of it. Otherwise, I would say, I mean, it's a risky game, <laughs> but uh, yes. Uh, sometime in the beginning, you said it's necessary to report uh, vulnerabilities and available updates to the authorities. What authorities are those? Um, it should be, so either the ENISA, if there is no uh, national body that is defined in your country at some point. So let's say you are in Germany, for instance, it will be the BSI. If you are in France, it will be the NSSI. And this is, I mean, I'm not taking any risks by answering this. This will be the notified bodies. Possibly some member states won't have a dedicated notified body, in which case it will be directly the NISA. And in any case, there will be, I assume, some kind of flow remediation process that will involve first communicating between all the, the official authorities and then informing all the concerned parties because uh, it's good to notify the authorities but it's better if the authorities notify back over 
um, device manufacturer, for instance, that would be impacted by a, a, an attack that's on the device and that would not necessarily be, be aware of it. Yes? Thank you. Um, I'm not clear if the Cyber Resilient Act uh, uh, define exactly the responsibility uh, of compliance for an open source software. I mean, uh, I'm a pro producer, so I have products which uh, are uh, full of uh, open source software inside, and uh, it's not clear what I have to do and what uh, it's uh, in charge to someone else. Uh, basically, the first version of the uh, text, of the Sierra text, put too much responsibility on open source software. Be providers, so, so Now in the last version, we've got uh, the notion of open source steward, which are large foundations that are assumed to be able to have some level of responsibility with respect to the proper maintenance uh, and uh, maintenance in secure condition and proper reporting of vulnerabilities of their software but it will never be the same level of responsibility as someone who commercially, uh, well, that, that's basically the difference. The, 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 there is some distinction between someone who does business with a product, basically, and someone who, uh, who provides it for free. So you've got this notion of open source steward, and the effect it should have also is to drag uh, people like you or me to go to uh, uh, well-maintained, uh, well-used uh, software for which we would have an opportunity to source the word to discuss with. The other possibility is that you need some piece of software, but you cannot take the maintainer of the developer of the software responsible for its security because uh, it's not large enough, it doesn't have the manpower, or etc. And now you will have part of the responsibility to help this developer. Uh, I mean, you could fix things in some piece of software that is not uh, granted as secure, in which case you would have to contribute your fixes to the, to the, to the, the open source. And you would be, in any case, you are responsible of, for the software you are using in your product and you are, uh, and you are, uh, so you are responsible when you choose it. Thanks. I think we don't have more time for questions. Thanks a lot for attending. And uh, see you later.